Uh, yeah, hey everybody. Uh, it's really, really good to be here. Um, so, I'm gonna, I'll am start just by being clear about it. My name is Jesse Shell, and I am a VR-holic. I had my first taste of VR just when I had uh, turned about 21, the early 90s. Um, I was a, uh, an early VR project I worked on back when VR was about helmets that could protect your, your head. Uh, after going on doing that work at grad school, I went to Disney where I worked in the Disney Virtual Reality Studio and became the creative director there doing all kinds of interesting projects. Then went on to teach at Carnegie Mellon where I've been for the last 14 years where we've done hundreds of VR projects uh, over the years using a variety of technologies. And of course I also run Shell Games and so when VR started coming into the consumer space Naturally, I was really interested. I was, I was uh, manic about, oh my God, we've got to get this out there. And so we started working on entertainment products. So I Expect You to Die. Some people may have seen kind of a comedy spy game that we've uh, worked on. We'll be coming out for the Oculus Touch. And our first educational game, <clears throat> Water Bears VR, uh, which is a systems thinking game that we uh, developed with uh, University of Indiana. It's available now on the Vive, and I, I love how the popular user-defined tags in the lower right-hand corner, indie, casual, VR, cute, and psychological horror. <clears throat> Everyone has opinions, I suppose. So, a lot of people are saying, geez, VR for education, but VR isn't really here. Is this really a technology that's ready? And I'm telling you, no, seriously, the future is here now. Um, but as William Gibson once said, it's just not evenly distributed yet. So uh, it is here, but just it's not in everybody's hands quite yet. Uh, 2016 is definitely going to be the year when VR enters the consumer marketplace and does not go away. All, the number of systems that are coming out for this Christmas and the amount of high quality content that is going to be available for them is going to make kind of a big thunderclap uh, in the universe. And uh, we're going to see this stuff come and it's going to stay. Now I know some people are skeptical because you say, you know what, I was here in the 90s and I remember everybody said this uh, back then. We had VR back in the 90s. So, uh, you know, what's, what's different? And I'll tell you, well, there's a number of things um, that are different. And one thing to realize, because some people argue, some people argue that uh, uh, it didn't work in the 90s, why could it possibly work now? What's really different? And I, the thing I, I would like to remind people about is technology sometimes do take time to develop to the point that they're usable. When most people think about the invention of television, for example, they think that, yeah, television showed up, what, in the 30s or something, and then there it was in the, in the 40s, and then we had it. And it wasn't like that. Television was invented in 1884, okay? The first demonstration of a television system was the Nipkow disk system, uh, mechanically based television. And can you imagine what it was like being in that 43-year period, being a researcher working on television, it's like 1915, and you're like, no, we're getting close, we've almost got it, and people are like, oh, come on, that's never gonna come, that's never gonna happen, it just, it's, technology doesn't work and people don't want it. And then what did it take? 43 years later, it took a 20-year-old punk named Philo Farnsworth to say, you know what, actually, if you move the electron beam with a magnet, uh, I think we may have solved all the problems. And uh, suddenly, we had uh, the, the key that we needed to make television go mass market. And there's an eerie parallel with VR. VR showed up in 1968. Uh, similarly, a mechanical system, you know, Ivan Sutherland was leading the research on that. And wouldn't you know it, 43 years later, a 20-year-old punk named Palmer Lucky shows up, and he says, you know, if you, uh, if you just used uh, these, these slightly different technologies, um, this thing could actually work. And so I think we're seeing kind of a similar uh, breakthrough. Now, a lot of people are saying, now, wait a second. I'd heard all this with 3D TV. I heard how 3D TV was going to come in. Everyone's going to do 3D TV, and that's not what really happened. And that's true, that did not happen. And that, and a lot of people say, so that didn't work, so therefore no one's gonna want VR either. But to say that is to misunderstand the nature of and the importance of 3D. 3D in itself is not really that compelling an experience. And we have evidence of this. 
Um, 3D was invented in 1849. This is not a new technology. People have been looking at three-dimensional imagery for, for over 100 years. Um, who here has a camera in some form with them right now? Who here took a picture today? Who here took a 3D picture today? No, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> excellent. Almost nobody. And why, is the technology not there? No, we have the technology to do this. We just don't care. 3D in image format is just not that compelling to us. But 3D, when you put it into a VR format, gives you something very special. It gives this feeling of presence. And it's very hard to describe this feeling of presence if you haven't done it. If you haven't tried one of the new high-end VR systems, such as the Vive or the Oculus Rift with the touch controls, you really should, because it's very difficult to describe. The, the, what happens is your body seems to actually believe it is in a new place. Um, it's just, here's an example of one of the games that we made for the Vibe is this Water Bears game. I'll show you. Here's, here's a YouTuber, a popular YouTuber who was playing it a bit. Let's see what do we have in the menu. We got some pipes we can use. Oh, look at me go. Let's give him some sweet, sweet lemonade. There ya go. And now he's going to turn red. Yes, he is. Oh man, oh man. And he's going to hit the confetti bubble. Puzzle solved, use portal to continue. Yes, 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 yes. So now what we find in these, particularly in these walk around experiences, that what happens is people sort of forget that it's not real. And we see all the time things, because the, the game happens on this virtual table, and it involves a lot of thinking in the advanced puzzles. And people will often, they'll be looking and looking, and then they'll go and they'll lean on the table. And it's not there. And, and they'll, they'll kind of, whoa, and they have to catch themselves. And in fact, um, if, if, I, if I go back a couple slides, see those little wrist uh, bracelets? That's because people very often like go to set the controllers on a virtual table, and they'll just drop them on the floor because, because they forget. And this feeling of being in a place engages the mind in a way that is remarkable. When you think about, I don't know, Gardner's theories of multiple intelligences, um, so many of your intelligences get uh, channeled into this experience, which makes it wonderful for education. Technologically, what, some of the breakthroughs that we've had, some people say, oh, I can't do it because of motion sickness. And this has largely been conquered. Um, and we know the formula for it now. If you do these things, you, we have VR experiences that have absolutely no motion sickness at all. Now, for people who aren't familiar with the systems that are out now, because there are systems that are out now, we're just on the verge of coming out. I just want to give a quick tour so you can kind of think about and understand the space. The ones you may have heard about the most are the mobile VR systems. These usually involve putting a phone in a box on your face. Um, and the popular ones are the Google Cardboard and the Samsung Gear. And these are nice experiences, but they're not completely powerful as the other category, which I would, I'm just flat out calling VR with hands. These are things that have hand controllers. The three big systems are the HTC Vive, the Sony PlayStation VR, and the Oculus Rift, which has touch controllers that are coming out uh, this, this fall. And all of these give a deep sense of presence by letting you actually put your hands into the world and be able to move around in the world. Now, interestingly, so there's not much in that middle space um, right now, but there's one system that's been announced. Google just announced their Daydream system, which is a mobile system that has a hand controller. It's not quite as powerful as some of these other uh, hand controllers, but it is an interesting uh, hybrid. And I'm expecting to see many more of these mobile systems start to have meaningful hand tracking and hand controllers very soon. Now, some people will say, well, I get it, but this VR stuff, it's all about games. This is an interesting survey that the, the Greenlight VR folks did. They, they interviewed uh, something around, uh, I, I think, around 1,000 um, sort of just mainstream consumers uh, in America, uh, not gamers, but these were consumers who had some interest and intention to the, the, they thought VR was something they wanted to do. And they asked, well, what are you interested in? And I thought it was, you'd think that gaming would be at the top of the list. Gaming was actually near, uh, near the bottom of the list compared to a lot of these other things. And while explicitly stating education, and it's interesting to think about that, desire for educational VR content 
outweighed desire for gaming content I find fascinating. And then, of course, when you think about travel and tourism, that's really a kind of education um, as, as well, and certainly a lot of live events could be. Um, so really, I feel like there is a lot of uh, potential demand for educational VR experiences. So what subjects is VR going to be good at teaching? And what I find when I kind of go through thought exercises about it, almost every subject that we think about, there's some way to, to have, to be able to use uh, virtual reality to improve it. Certainly imagine, I mean, we know geography lessons can be fairly dry. Imagine geography lessons where you can visit any place on the globe. That is right around the corner. That's possible now um, to really put people in a, in a sense of being in a place and to better understand that place and the people who live there. And think about history and being able to create, what, it, what would it, is it like to try and make history come alive? We're seeing this massive popularity with Hamilton right now. And what people who see Hamilton and love it say is, I never had history be so relatable before. VR is going to be a medium that's going to allow historical subjects to be relatable by actually putting yourself in these historical contexts. Mathematics, so abstract, can be very hard for people to grasp. What about now when you can literally grasp mathematics with your hands and manipulate numbers and formulas and graphs and equations and get an intuitive kinesthetic sense of the way that mathematics works. I often think about Einstein talking about how he figured out relativity. He said he often liked to imagine that he was flying around in space riding on a light beam. And it was by that, imagining that, that he was able to put it all together. Um, and virtual reality is certainly a tool for imagination. And chemistry is one that's on my mind very much. And uh, we recently received an IES grant uh, to, to begin creating a virtual chemistry laboratory. The idea is to let every high school be able to have a chemistry laboratory where there is no expense for the chemicals, there is no danger of flame or poison or broken glass, and that any, you can, any high school could have a college level chemistry lab with no, with no danger in it. And, and so we're trying to build that now. And there are just so, so many more, almost, uh, almost anything, um, there, there can be a way to use this technology. Even for things that are uh, sort of social contexts, I want to show you just a little clip of a student project that was done at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, called Injustice, about getting people to understand some of the, the conflicts that can happen in encounters with the police. Stay still, cannot, stay still. Why, but why are you doing this? You cannot do this to me. What do they think they're doing? Stop. Get away. Stop. Just want to get out. Are you Stop. with him? Stop. How do you know this guy? Is he with you? Yeah, he was just standing here. Hands up now. And I love that example of putting your hands up in the world. the world. The game cannot sense your hands, but your body forgets. To your body and your brain, this is real. And people do put up their hands, and anecdotally, white people tend not to put up their hands. That's just an anecdote. Anyway, there's a, there's a lot of things to be learned from experiences like this, and people find them very powerful. Now, I know a lot of people are saying, now wait, this virtual reality thing, that's fine, but honestly, I find it a little creepy. What I really want is augmented reality that's like a pair of glasses and it and it's, uh, overlays my world. That's what I really want. Well, some of that is here now. Uh, we've got systems like the, the Google Tango uh, that is, is coming out. Lenovo's first phone is going to be coming out very shortly that has Tango integration. Uh, we found this works very well. We've created an entertainment experience with it about uh, setting dominoes up. Uh, all over the place. But of course, you can do augmented reality now even with simple phones and uh, iPads. I'm going to show you just a quick video of the Happy Atoms project that our team's been working on that uses physical toys integrated with augmented reality app.
and we're starting an Indiegogo campaign on Tuesday. So please, if, if you're interested, go to happyadams.com and sign up. No, I'll wait. You can do it right now. No, okay. we better keep going. Um, but a lot of people say, okay, that's fine. This sort of handheld augmented reality. But I want what you wear on your face, right? And so here's a, the, here's a, a promotional video from uh, the folks at uh, Microsoft HoloLens. With HoloLens, you could imagine having a class standing around a model, almost like a tour group in a museum, where they're all interacting completely naturally. Now, you, and, this, and the key word here, unfortunately, is imagine. You can imagine that you could have a class that could do this. Because the HoloLens is cool, but it costs around $3,000. And what they show here is a little not really how it is, because the truth is you have a field of view that's about this big. And so if you were looking at that skeleton, you'd be seeing like pieces and parts of that skeleton at a time. And so people's dream of having a completely immersive augmented reality system that, wear, that you wear like a pair of glasses isn't quite here yet. And everybody keeps saying, oh, no, 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 it's right around the corner. We think we know how to crack that. But honestly, I've been hearing that for 20 years, so I'm not sure about how true that is. My personal feeling on these pass-through augmented reality systems is they feel to me right now like VR felt to me back in the 90s. And I'm not saying it's going to be 20 years before it's like mass market ready, but there may be shortcuts, but I wouldn't hold my breath about developing cool stuff for this in the next uh, couple years. I'd, I'd be inclined to focus on the technologies that are here now, although this is a beautiful, beautiful dream because there's so much that could be done with it. So do you have to rush? Do you have to hurry? Well, educational VR becoming integrated into our traditional educational processes is not going to happen overnight. So I don't know how much of a rush there really is. Let me tell you why. First, the technology, yes, it's here now, but it's very new. We don't have standards. There are lots of different systems. No one's quite sure which ones are going to stick and which ones aren't going to stick. No one's, no one's quite sure what to buy and what to work on. And it's going to keep changing. We're going to see advancements of eye tracking and body tracking and all these different advancements are going to be coming over the next few years before it settles down. People are going to have a hard time. Schools and others are going to, like, which system should we buy? And they're going to be paralyzed uh, choosing a system because they don't know what they should buy. The technology right now is somewhat fragile. If you go into the average high school classroom and leave two steel ball bearings on the desk and you go away for five minutes, you will come back and one will be gone and one will be broken, right? And uh, VR systems are, are fragile. They're not really ready for that rough and tumble environment. Also, any place you're going to be sharing these things, the hygiene issue you know, it's bad enough sharing a keyboard that you touch with your hands. Imagine a keyboard that every time you used it, you had to rub your face on it, right? <laughs> you have no idea who used it before you, right? You, you have no, no idea, really. So the, the hygiene is a real issue that hasn't been completely solved. And then last, we just know in general, schools are slow to adopt new things. Motion pictures were invented over 100 years ago. And it is only sort of just now that with things like Khan Academy, the technology of the, mo of the moving picture is starting to cause anything like a revolution in education. So I'm not saying it'll take 100 years maybe, but it's, it's, it's not going to be super, super fast. But that doesn't mean you can't kind of be a pioneer in the space, but you should be realistic about the, uh, the, the time uh, wide scale adoption is going to happen. So I'm a big proponent of this book, The Wide Lens, which is all about looking at what is the environment really, what innovations is your environment actually ready for? Because you may have an amazing innovation that everybody likes, but if the environment's not ready for it, it doesn't stick, it doesn't go anywhere. So I think if you're interested in doing VR for education, you want to find the niches where it can work. Who is ready for it? So my thoughts about who's ready for it. First of all, gamers are chomping at the bit for this. Gamers have not had anything interesting and new happen in the video game space for about five or six years. They're ready for something new to happen. And you say, but I don't want to make entertainment games. I want to make educational games. Well, that's fine, but you know, you know, as Marshall McLuhan said, if you think entertainment and education are different, you don't know anything about either one. So if you can get your chops up making good entertainment VR, when the educational stuff is ready, you're going to be in a good place to take a step over. This is a big part of the reason we developed products like uh, I Expect You to Die, 
Um, personally, my long play is to want to get into VR for education, but we figured if we can kind of get good at it in entertainment, it'll be much easier to make that step. Who else is ready? Elite industry, uh, elite industry training, medical training, military training, very high-end technical training. Those folks, they have difficult problems they need to solve that like save lives, and they're willing to spend a lot of money on high-end training. And if you have an idea for like a, a VR system that will train them, there, there's potentially a, a market for that. Grantors, many grantors seem to be ready. Even though maybe the world's not ready, they want to be kind of ahead of the world. They want to help accelerate this and bring it into the world. So um, it's, it's worth thinking about. Maybe you can get ahead of the curve that way. Homeschool is something people don't think about very much. Homeschool parents often feel very inadequate about their resources, about what they can bring uh, to their kids compared to what the actual schools can bring. And uh, I think many of them are going to be interested in high-end VR experiences because it actually is quite well suited to the home, better than a traditional school because you don't have the hygiene issues, you don't have all these things, and there are a lot of homeschoolers out there. Colleges, I think, are going to be ready quite soon, and I'll tell you why. Um, a lot of people are predicting we are going to have a bubble bursting event that is going to happen with colleges, that colleges are in trouble because of this. If you look at college tuition compared to the consumer price index, this is not a sustainable situation. Sooner or later, it's going to break. Something's going to happen. Something's going to change. And I think many people are going to start to say, you know what? There are affordable op alternatives for me to college that I'm going to do instead. This is going to make colleges competitive to kind of say, look at these resources we have that others don't have. And the idea of a high-end virtual reality laboratory with the very best of the very best, I think a lot of colleges are going to start to want to use that as a differentiator. And if you can make content for them, I think that may work. Finally, this is going to sound weird, children are ready for VR. Now, as adults, a lot of adults are terrified of this notion, just as we were terrified of children watching television or using a cell phone or all these things. Um, and, uh, but, but kids, oh my god, they love it. And why do they love it? They love it so much because VR is a tool of the imagination. And compared to us who are, as adults, our imaginations are, are sort of faded and sad and broken. Their imaginations <laughs> are, are strong and powerful, much more powerful than ours. And so for them, these technologies work 10 times better. Because the way these things really work, there's us and we're looking at reality, but we don't really look at reality, do we? We look at it through our imagination. And when we talk about these technologies as an augmentation, as an augmented reality or some such, we're not really augmenting reality, we're really augmenting our imagination. These change the way we see the world. And when we make tools, uh, adults never become masters of the tools. It's always the children, the next generation of children, who become the masters of the tools. And so the kids who grow up, imagine what it's going to be like when they have the tools to see the world through the eyes of people like these. Because if we do these things right, we're going to be able to let you see the world through the eyes of Gandhi, through the eyes of Einstein, through the eyes of Picasso. Let me tell you a story. There was a time uh, not too long ago I was at a friend's house and he said, uh, hey, check out my new stainless steel refrigerator. What do you think? And I'm like, ooh, it's pretty nice. Do you like it? He said, yeah, I like it pretty well, but magnets don't stick to it. I can't have refrigerator magnets anymore. And I said, what? You know, I've always wondered about that. You know, stainless steel is steel. How, do, how is it made of steel and magnets don't stick to it? And he said, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know why. And his 11-year-old son was standing there who pulled out a phone and bip, bip, bip. And he says to us, yeah, um, stainless steel uh, has nickel mixed into it, which creates a crystalline structure which prevents magnetic fields. <laughs> and, and I said to him, is it amazing to you that you have all the knowledge in the world in your pocket with you at all times? Or, is, or do you just see that as normal? And he said, 
What was it like <laughs> to grow up in the age of ignorance? <laughs> and he wasn't being sarcastic. It was kind of, he was kind of pity and respect kind of at the same, <laughs> at the same time. And, and I really, I think it's true. I mean, the, the, and this is the power that these technologies bring us because what the internet brought us was the ability to think with shared memory. And what these new technologies bring us is the ability to see with shared eyes. Thanks very much. <laughs>